Uh, my name is David Murphy. I'm the Deputy Director of the Institute for Leadership and Sustainability here in Ambleside. And uh, this is one of our, this is the last of our open lecture series for the spring of 2016. And each time we have a cohort of the Robert Kennedy College MBA program or MA program, we organize one of these events on Tuesday as part of the program. And we also invite members of the community here in Ambleside and in the Lake District. Tonight, we have with us from the ILO in Geneva, Erica Martin. She's a legal officer. She works in the Standards Department, International Labor Standards for the ILO. And I'll let her tell you more about what she does specifically <coughs> in her job, but she has worked on child labor, forced labor, occupational health and safety in the workplace, fundamental principles and rights at work, as you see up here. And uh, the, the interesting story with Erica is that we have a personal connection as well in this world that we live in, lots of serendipity and a sense of really important connection. Five or six years ago, we were discussing on the way over here from Boness, when did we actually meet? Uh, my first cousin, Margot, is Erica's mother-in-law. She wasn't her mother-in-law then. Her partner, <laughs> David, my cousin, said uh, was visiting with Erica from Geneva. They were together at that time, and they, they, uh, they, Margot said to me, David, you need to meet this new girlfriend of, my, uh, of my, my son, because she works in a field that's just similar to yours. She's a Newfoundlander who's gone off and worked at the international level. So that was a really important connection. So we started our, our connection then. Uh, Erica subsequently has gone on to do other jobs within the ILO, and she'll, she'll speak more about that. But we've maintained the connection. When I came here to Ambleside, one of the things we like to do is bring people that we know are relevant for the program. And so the work that Erica does is more around the social side of sustainability, but certainly if you're talking about an occupational health and safety in the workplace, that also has an environmental element and certainly an economic element because the ILO is very much about the place of work, employers, organizations, workers, state enterprises, industries, and, and, and NGOs as well. So uh, I'm gonna hand over to Erica. She's gonna speak for roughly an hour. And what we will invite you is to intervene for questions of clarification during the first hour. And then we'll move into a, a free open discussion. So maybe the more challenging questions then. We're gonna videotape the first hour so we can use it as a part of our online uh, you know, blogging and things that we do here at IFLAS but we will not record the last half hour because, or 40 minutes because we want to make sure that that allows you to ask those challenging questions that Erica wouldn't be able to have videotaped, given that she works for the International Labor Organization. So over to you, Erica. Now, that, thank you very much yeah. for the lovely introduction, David. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here uh, this evening with all of you, and I'd like to thank you all uh, for coming out. Uh, this evening. Um, as David mentioned, uh, I know there is a tremendous amount of expertise and knowledge in this room and I really do want to leave a lot of time for discussion and exchange. Uh, notwithstanding throughout, if there is any questions of clarification uh, that you'd like to ask, please feel free to do so. Um, I'd ask before you intervene if you could just state where you're from and what sector uh, you work in because I know you know each other but I do not know you. Um, and uh, afterwards, of course, we hope to have a long and hopefully uh, fruitful uh, exchange. So with that, we'll get going. Uh, today we'll be examining um, what are the fundamental principles and rights at work, firstly. Secondly, we'll be examining why businesses should care about them, what businesses can do to promote them, and how they can be promoted throughout supply chains. Um, before we begin examining this more concretely, I wanted to just start with a short video that uh, explains a little bit about the work of the ILO. Um, as David mentioned, I work mostly on international labor standards, uh, so the international conventions and recommendations, as well as work uh, with the supervisory mechanisms um, through which these standards um, are monitored. Uh, but this is a bit of a video on the ILO's broader work um, in technical cooperation. It focuses on specifically um, uh, the tobacco supply chain in Zambia. The long road that Musole Fufu walks with her uncle and six-year-old brother is not the road to school. 
They are crossing a field to find the underground coal fires that her uncle lit a few days earlier. Barefoot in the humidity and dust, she and her brother dig and pick up pieces of charcoal which by the end of the day fill bags that weigh 25 kilos. Her uncle Mike will sell the bags along the road for just a few dollars each. Kaoma region in the western part of Zambia is known for its tobacco plantations. While waiting for the harvest season, children spend their free time working in the production of charcoal or picking caterpillars out of the trees which are then cooked and dried in the sand. Other children work for hours carrying heavy cans of water to tend the small seedlings in the tobacco nurseries that will soon be planted. Children like Mubile Niglish come to this water hole twice a day. I am ordering the seed beds to help my family and to get food. I don't like to do this. During the harvest season, often I drop out of school to help them cut the tobacco leaves. Once I injured my leg offloading a tobacco bag from a cart. The International Labour Organization has set up the ORISE project as part of its international program for the elimination of child labour to reduce child labour in tobacco growing communities of Zambia. With funding provided through a public-private partnership, the ILO set up local commissions called District Child Labour Committees, or DCLCs, to have an integrated approach to tackling the problem in the most vulnerable communities in the region. We work on awareness raising, capacity strengthening, and then also the actual direct interventions to identify the children at risk and those already engaged in various forms of child labour. Uh, work with those structures on the ground because these are the ones who, are, who continue with the monitoring uh, and ongoing support to those children and families where they are coming from. The Minister of Labour and Social Security, which has an office in Kaoma and Kema, works very closely with DCLC members. So when they do the regular inspections, uh, we either on the farms or in the workplaces, Wherever we have found cases and issues of children being involved in hazardous forms of work, inspections are done. And where withdrawals have been conducted, we go there to verify, to ensure that uh, it is true that these children are no longer there, and no longer working. The program helps local communities train former child laborers through apprenticeships in masonry, carpentry, animal husbandry, agriculture, and sewing. Hundreds of children have already been trained and thousands more have been educated about the risk and dangers that work in the tobacco fields pose to their health and development. Self-help groups have been created and nearly 200 families have received microloans to help them launch small income generating activities. Febi Kahali worked several years in the tobacco fields and never managed to finish her schooling. But thanks to the Arise program, here at the Youth Resource Center of Kaoma, she is now being trained to cultivate and manage fish or chicken farms. These skills have given new meaning to her life. So in the future I want to become a very big farmer. Yes, even to join in the companies and I can help my parents. Through the Arise program, the ILO organizes community theater and musical events in schools with students and their parents. They are designed to point out the dangers that child labor poses for children's health and to raise awareness about how important education is for their future. In the beginning, it was a bit hard. The parents were finding it difficult. They were mad at us. But today they understand because we even call them and we have meetings with them to educate them on the usefulness of their children being in school. So we are telling them this is a program that will sustain your child. It's it's an everlasting program that will benefit the entire family, not just the child. The road to eliminating child labor in Zambia is a long one. But thanks to the ILO's Arise program, children from all over Kaoma are finding their way out of the fields, back to school, to a better future. Um, one thing I just want to say about the video is it's an ILO video, so obviously it emphasizes the role of the ILO in that project, uh, but it must be underlined that the project is only operating and is only successful because the Zambian government has really made a commitment uh, 
to addressing child labor. I think the video really emphasizes the role of the ILO, but uh, it really is, uh, the motive behind that is the Ministry of Labor uh, in the government uh, who has really taken on addressing child labor in the country as a priority. Also underemphasized a bit is the important role of uh, private partners in that project. Um, regardless of what you might say about the ethics of the tobacco industry, one thing that several uh, tobacco companies are taking quite seriously is addressing child labor within their supply chains, and they've actually contributed quite a bit of funding to uh, initiatives such as these. So it focuses mostly on the ILO's role, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that uh, it's really the national government that is pushing it, as well as private funding um, that allows it to be successful. Uh, so we are now going to turn to the fundamental principles and rights at work, but our entry point into this discussion is going to be something that many of you I know are familiar with, the guiding principles on uh, business and human rights, uh, otherwise known as the Ruggie principles. So this, these principles aim to be a global standard that will help businesses in implementing their obligations with respect to human rights. Uh, it was developed uh, by the, special, the UN Special Rapporteur on Business and Human Rights, John Ruggie. That's why it's often known, as many of you might know it, as the Ruggie Principles. Uh, and it was endorsed by the uh, UN Human Rights Council in 2011. As many of you know, these principles were developed following extensive consultations with governments, stakeholders, NGOs, and particularly with businesses. It comprises of three main pillars, the state duty to protect human rights, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, as well as thirdly, the importance of victims of human rights abuses to have access to remedies. Now, um, the foundational principles of the guiding principles is that businesses should respect human rights. But often the question arises, what do we mean by human rights in this context? Luckily, the principles make it quite clear that at a minimum in this context, human rights uh, mean the International Bill of Human Rights, as well as the fundamental principles and rights at work, which we'll be focusing on today. Uh, and the obligation uh, under these principles for businesses is that they should respect these human rights. Um, that means avoiding infringing on human rights, as well as aiming to address adverse impacts that their activities could have on human rights. Turning then to the fundamental principles and rights at work. I know I've said it many times so far in this presentation, so I'm glad that now I get a chance to explain what that means. Ultimately, it means there are f it is defined as four specific categories of principles and rights at work that uh, all uh, countries should promote and uh, promote the realization of. This is freedom of association and collective bargaining, uh, the elimination of forced labor, the eradication of child labor, and uh, the promotion of non-discrimination and equality. This declaration was adopted in 1998 uh, and then invoked the responsibility of all member states to promote and realize these rights. The content of these rights is defined specifically with reference to these eight fundamental conventions. You'll see there are two for each category. Uh, and it is within these conventions that we find a definition of what we mean when we're talking about fundamental principles and rights at work. For example, we've already talked about child labor today, and often uh, in different contexts, the term child labor can mean different things. But in this context, luckily, we have it clearly defined in conventions 138 on the minimum age and convention number 182 on the worst forms of child labor. So for example, child labor defined under convention number 182 is a description of types of work that no person under 18, regardless of a country's level of development or regardless of a country's national situation, should children under the age of 18 ever be permitted to do. So that involves, firstly, all forms of forced or compulsory labor, including trafficking, including forced recruitment of children for use in armed services. Uh, and secondly, uh, would be all forms of commercial sexual exploitation, prostitution and pornography, 
Uh, thirdly, the use of children in illegal activities, uh, notably uh, the production and trafficking of drugs. And fourthly, in hazardous work, which under this convention number 182, member states would have uh, an obligation to define specifically what hazardous work means in their national context. So while these conventions are a universal standard, countries have to implement them in different ways. Could you give an example of some of those types of hazardous work in different, uh, you know, just more generally across the world so that we just know what kinds of industries they are more generally? Yep. Uh, so, uh, as I was about to say, these standards are universal, but they have a certain level of flexibility. And one aspect um, of that flexibility is they realize hazardous work is unacceptable and should be prohibited for all persons under 18. But hazardous work means different things in different countries. Often people say, oh, mining. I know mining. I know it's hazardous. But are there some countries in which mining could take place with incredible occupational safety and health standards that are closely monitored, that if you had a child working above ground, a 17-year-old above ground, it wouldn't be hazardous? And that's why they allow there to be that flexibility. Countries often choose mining, fishing, uh, work in specific types of factories, work with chemicals, work with pesticides uh, as hazardous forms of work. There are some countries that have decided that agriculture constitutes a form of hazardous work in their country. There are other countries that say agriculture in our country is done very safely. We uh, have a lot of personal protective equipment for anybody working with pesticides and therefore it wouldn't constitute a specific hazard in that context. Um, but one example, for example, on um, how these standards are universal but mean different obligations for different countries would be forced labor. Um, the ILO estimates that globally there are approximately 21 million workers caught worldwide in situations that amount to forced labor, meaning that there, and there is, in fact, forced labor in every single country of the world through trafficking, modern forms of slavery, bonded labor, um, but different countries have an obligation to address those uh, based on the kind of forced labor that they see specifically in their national context. Of those 21 million workers, approximately 11 million are estimated to be in Asia. And one form of uh, forced labor that we see quite frequently is something known as debt bondage. Um, it's particularly prominent in India and Pakistan. Uh, it's a system of forced labor through which uh, debts that are voluntarily incurred um, are through the system uh, through which um, high, extraordinarily high interest rates are permitted to be charged. Uh, a person who will then have to pay back uh, that debt through labor will never be able to in full pay back that debt and then will for their entire lifetime notably be subject to labor to their debtor. Often um, many people are trapped in, forced la or in debt bondage because their parents incurred debt or their grandparents incurred debt and this can persist for generations. Uh, but of course addressing it is notoriously difficult because lending uh, is an important aspect for how you know uh, many communities would have any access to credit. So you can't permit prohibit uh, the incurrence of debt, but uh, there's been quite uh, uh, it's been quite a challenge to address. But for example, the governments in India and Pakistan have both enacted bonded labor abolition acts and are working hard to enforce and uh, address debt bondage in that country. But in another country, the obligation to address forced labor would look completely different. Um, one, rather than debt bondage of local uh, nationals, it could be uh, forced labor of migrant workers. Um, one country, uh, one example that's received a lot of scrutiny uh, recently, and it's subject currently to a complaint before the ILO, is a certain Gulf country that uh, is hosting a major sporting event in 2022. Um, this country, and it's been subject, I think The Guardian has done uh, several exposés on allegations of forced labor in that country. Um, it's a country with 300,000 citizens and about 1.7 million migrant workers. Um, not all 1.7 million migrant workers are alleged to be in situations of forced labor, 
but there are a few factors that contribute specifically to the vulnerability of those workers to be more likely to be engaged in situations that are transformed into situations of forced labor. Uh, for example, um, uh, in, those, in this specific country and in several countries in the Gulf, uh, they, uh, their migration works under a system called the kafala system, also known as the sponsorship system. So a worker coming, um, and in this country it's normally from Southeast Asia, but also some African countries, migrant workers voluntarily uh, come to the country and under the sponsorship system are tied to one specific employer. That doesn't seem, uh, that doesn't seem very out of the norm in many countries, that's how migrant labor works. But in these specific countries, they're tied to one specific employer and they cannot leave that employer even if they found another employer in the country who's willing to take them on as an employee. It's my case. <laughs> it's my case. You're a migrant worker. <coughs> I'm a general manager, I'm not the labor, but it's my case. It, exactly, no, and so, and we have a huge diversity of a lot of, um, so in this country with 1.7 million migrant workers, the allegation, Okay, okay. <laughs> so, and that's the thing. It's, uh, it's very important to clarify that often people think, oh, 1.7 million, they must all be in situations of forced labor. But there are huge variations within these populations, the skills that they come with, the jobs that they are hired to perform. And um, so the reason, it seems reasonable that you be tired. Go ahead. Let me just interrupt one thing. Go ahead. Um, I've been in that region for more than 16, 17 years. I fully understand what you're saying, but if you talk to those laborers, I have. Some, most of them are happy because it's either this or nothing. Uh, I think that's a really important point uh, because we, I'm first going to finish by describing the system, but then we'll come back to why it continues to happen. And I think that the huge supply of workers willing to come is a huge factor. And I think um, addressing it in a sustainable manner isn't about only getting the, the, the receiving countries to reform the situation in their country, but also improving opportunities in the sending countries uh, so workers are less desperate to accept anything upon arrival. I've broken my own ground rules, which was that we were going to let you get, get on yeah. with that. So I'll let, I'll let you continue on with your presentation before we get into that. That we're starting to get yep. into those more challenging questions, and that's what we want to get yes. to. But we need to yes. get through some of the material to get there. So right. sorry, sorry for having okay. uh, intervened there. Yeah. No, no. Um, <laughs> uh, so the kafala system. So each worker, one employer. Seems reasonable. It's the way migrant labor works in many countries. In these particular countries, they're tied to one employer and not allowed to leave that employer unless they have permission from that employer and not allowed to leave the country unless they have permission from their employer. Um, a lot of, as has been pointing out, pointed out, workers volunteer and there's quite a bit of competition to be able to come and work in that country. Uh, and because there's such high competition, they end up paying huge uh, fees to um, uh, labor recruiters. Uh, in their home country, incurring a lot of debt to then be able to go and work in the country. Unfortunately, a practice that has been um, alleged to be widespread is a practice known as contract substitution, where you sign a contract saying, for example, you're going to be working as a domestic worker for eight hours a day, being paid $800 a month. You arrive in the country and are said, told, sorry, you're going to be working 14 hours a day for $300 a month and then you sign that contract. On that basis, it's tremendously difficult for them to leave the situation, uh, leave their job because they can't go back before they paid off their debt. But even if they did want to go back, they're not allowed without permission from their employer um, to either leave the country. Even if they are proactive, find another employer who's willing to take them on, that is again prohibited. However, uh, I would like to say that the country is taking a lot of action in light of the international scrutiny to try to address this. Uh, contract substitution, the practice I just described, has been made illegal um, 
monitoring on that. There are still allegations that it's not properly enforced, but in law, it's illegal. Passport retention uh, has been made illegal. Again, monitoring remains an issue, but uh, even if then a worker were to escape and manage to try to leave the country, they wouldn't be able to without their passport. That's been made illegal. And with respect to the kafala system, they are working on addressing it uh, making it slightly more flexible that even if your employer says no, you're not allowed to leave the country, you're thereby allowed to, you're then allowed to apply uh, to the government uh, and then get permission to leave the country. Notwithstanding, as our colleague just said, uh, the last time I was in this country, I ended up speaking to a worker who had been in a neighboring country, gotten in trouble with uh, the immigration authorities there for by their accounts, uh, reasons beyond their control, had spent two months in jail before being deported. And then you ask them, and you decided to come back? And they said, of course, because I can make more money here than I could ever make back home. So, and because of that, there's also been a lot of difficulty in getting sending countries to do their due diligence in preparing workers, uh, in monitoring uh, uh, labor recruiters within their countries uh, to properly address this because there is such a high demand. So uh, these, when you ratify this convention, it's the state's obligation to implement. But they do have difficulty if they can't find sending countries that are willing to cooperate. Um, but I would love to hear more later on your experience. And I think that it is a difficult issue because there if one person gets deported, there's five more workers who are willing to risk coming to that country. However, the fact that they are willing to voluntarily come to the country does not deny the fact that they have a right to not work under situations of forced labor. And finding the concrete ways to address that will continue to be a challenge. Um, I also just wanted to point out uh, that these it's important to emphasize that these are obligations on all states. Uh, and I think a lot of the examples that I'll be using when we're examining supply chains will come from developing countries, but it's, as, uh, it's also the obligation of developed countries uh, to implement these. Um, I'm Canadian. Uh, I come from uh, Canada. And recently, uh, with respect to, for example, Freedom of Association, Convention Number 87, Canada recently uh, was told by its own Supreme Court that it was in violation of this convention because it has specific modalities for collective bargaining and freedom of association for certain categories of workers, but it excluded in some provinces agricultural workers and police officers, and its own Supreme Court said, you are not properly implementing this convention. Um, but in another country, the obligation to respect freedom of association and collective bargaining could look particularly different. It wouldn't just necessarily be enacting a legislative regime through which uh, unions can work and organize their activities. Um, in some countries where there's been quite a bit of violence against trade unionists, this convention would mean a positive obligation on the government to take specific action uh, to pre prevent against discrimination uh, as well as violence. Uh, there's a certain Latin American country which uh, was characterized by significant levels of violence uh, and had a not very good reputation with respect to freedom of association. I think in 2009, approximately 50 trade unionists were assassinated. Uh, since then, though, the government has been very proactive in taking measures. One thing that it did implement was a specific protection fund on vulnerable populations, um, including trade unionists. Uh, and then out of this fund would protect provide specific security measures for trade unionists um, that then resulted in, I think, an 80 or 90 percent decline in murders of trade unionists, which still means it's an ongoing problem, but um, uh, there can be various obligations uh, that they can continue to implement. The last thing I want to emphasize about these eight conventions is that they are developed in a tripartite manner. Uh, they're developed through negotiation between employers, workers, and governments. Uh, so their intention is to be both aspirational as well as realistic and achievable. And that is why the discussions are tripartite and when they are voted to be adopted, they are tripartite. They are not obligations imposed on governments. Governments have to choose to ratify these conventions. 
Um, but once they do choose to ratify the conventions, they are subject to the obligations they're under, including the obligation to implement them and the obligation to report on their application. I work specifically on those supervisory procedures, so if you have any questions afterwards on the development of conventions or their supervision, I would love to discuss more. Um, so, uh, like I said, these are obligations on states. They're not obligations on companies. Nonetheless, these conventions have very high rates of ratification. Convention 29 on forced labor and convention number 182 on the worst forms of child labor have near universal ratification. So regardless of um, what country a company is operating in, that state is likely subject to the obligations under, uh, under these conventions. For example, the UK I know has ratified all eight, as have many countries. But now we will turn not to what states have to do under these conventions, but what companies can do to implement these four categories of fundamental principles and rights at work. You're about halfway through. Thank you. There's no clock in here, so I asked them to let me know. Um, so uh, a growing trend that we've seen in the last decade is uh, a reflection explicitly of these fundamental principles and rights at work in corporate codes of conduct. In studies that they did in the 1990s, there was sporadic references. I think about 40% referred to child labor and forced labor, even fewer to freedom of association. But within the last 10 years, you've really seen a growth in corporate codes of conduct referring explicitly to uh, the fundamental principles and rights of work. I think child labor and forced labor are at about 80%. Freedom of association is at about 90%. Um, some corporate codes of conduct really incorporate the fundamental principles and rights of work, an explicit reference to the Declaration, uh, as well as detailed obligations based on the conventions. For example, the Corporate Code of Conduct of Heineken, everyone's favorite beer, uh, explicitly talks about uh, the fundamental principles and rights of work, and the obligations of its suppliers uh, with respect to child labor are outlined based on Convention Number 138, on minimum age. Uh, now I think many of you know much more about corporate social responsibility than I do, so uh, I won't tell you that there's variations with respect to uh, implementation of corporate codes of conduct, but I know that they've done a lot of innovative work on uh, how compliance with these codes of conduct are measured, including innovative indicators. I know with respect to freedom of association, uh, monitoring of corporate codes of conduct often examines the number of collective agreements that have been adopted or the rate of unionization among suppliers. Um, and uh, we've also seen, yeah, a proliferation in specific indicators related to forced labor, child labor, and to a certain extent also uh, non-discrimination. Uh, now, I really always find it interesting when uh, you read about how often the regions in which, or the countries in which codes of conduct are the most successful are those countries that have a, a robust national legal framework and a uh, good system for enforcing the national law. And I think it makes sense to a certain degree. It's, a, it's easier for suppliers to comply with standards if they have national laws to follow and uh, national enforcement mechanism to keep them in line. But it also often means, I think, that we have the corporate codes of conduct are most successful in contexts where they're um, the least useful. But I think it does highlight the importance of state initiatives and state obligations under these conventions, as well as the innovative work done by a lot of companies themselves to implement these codes of conduct. Just by way of example, Uh, this is uh, extracts from a corporate code of conduct of a very popular um, re, um, clothing manufacturer. And uh, this code of conduct is applicable to all of their suppliers, all of their subcontractors, and all of their business partners. And it starts off by saying child labor is not accepted, but then it has to explain a little bit more what they mean by child labor. They refer specifically to conventions 138 and 182. Concretely, what does this mean for the company? Uh, one example that this company had to deal with was child labor in their cotton uh, supply chain. Um, 
There is a certain Central Asian country that is a major cotton producer, produces about 10% of uh, global cotton exports and was a, uh, including where uh, many of the fabric for this company, um, where the cotton came for the fabric for uh, many, um, much of the clothing of this country. Uh, it ran into difficulty, I think, about a decade ago when allegations continued to emerge that there was significant forced labor of children in that country. It's a former Soviet state um, where the cotton industry was not only, the cotton sector was not only state organized, uh, but uh, state directed. So while there were some smallholder farmers, they were all required to sell their cotton to the uh, a state affiliated agency. But each region was given a specific cotton quota that they had to meet. What a lot of regional governments did in order to meet that cotton quota was the mobilization of children, specifically in the harvest. So you'd see between a couple weeks to a month and a half in September, October during the cotton harvest, teachers would take the children out of school into the fields to pick cotton. And this would then allow the specific regional governments to be able to meet their cotton quotas. Um, obviously, it's a violation of uh, the convention with respect to child labor, specifically as it's mobilization of children without uh, their uh, freely given consent constitutes forced child labor. And uh, this company actually had to stop um, using cotton from this country, I think in 2012, when international pressure was mounting. That being said, the country has since taken a lot of measures to address forced child labor in um, their country. They have first, first they banned, uh, child, uh, legally banned children from working in cotton harvesting. That wasn't that effective because even though they had the uh, national ban on uh, child labor, you also still had the quotas for all of the regions. So regional governments would say, but how else am I supposed to har uh, harvest the cotton? I'm getting conflicting messages here. Um, uh, there was also a lot of monitoring um, done. Uh, the ILO, with, in partnership with UNICEF, did a lot of monitoring in that country, specifically during the harvest season, as well as raising the capacity of labor inspectors to be able to detect uh, situations of child labor. Uh, that was ongoing. However, uh, so the country has since, uh, by all accounts, made a lot of progress and that children in September and October are no longer mobilized from the classroom to pick cotton. However, it's not necessarily a happy ending yet, though we're optimistic, but these regional governments still need to find someone to pick the cotton and now there are significant allegations uh, relating to the use of public employees um, to uh, engage in cotton harvesting. We have teachers, nurses, public sector employees, doctors, as well as people receiving welfare benefits who are now engaged in cotton harvesting. If it's not done voluntarily, if it's not um, with uh, their free consent, that does constitute forced labor. So it's an ongoing story and I don't think H&M has yet gone back and uh, is no longer, is still not uh, accepting fabric made from cotton from this specific country. Um, uh, just more examples from their corporate code of conduct, like we mentioned, uh, forced labor now, um, they make reference to conventions 29-105. With respect to freedom of association, they make clear reference to conventions 87 and uh, 98. And then of course, with respect to non-discrimination, conventions 100 and 111. With respect to the example of cotton, I do want to clarify that I do recognize that for many of you, cotton might seem like such a simple supply chain. You have the cotton harvest, you have the ginning, the spinning, the weaving, the fabric, goes to the factory, makes the clothes, goes to the retailer. And I think often it's used, textiles are used as an example of um, progress with respect to supply chain management. But if you talk to someone who works in airplanes, they think, well, <laughs> they have it very easy. I mean, there's thousands of components that go into making my phone and then being able to monitor uh, with the same certainty that they're able to do in the textile sector. Uh, it, seems, uh, it seems a bit easy, but you still see that uh, they are facing challenges and there is still a lot more work to be done. Um, briefly, we won't spend a lot of time on this, so we can leave more time for discussion. 
Uh, but um, another, uh, like codes of conduct, another um, important thing done by a lot of lead firms are um, private compliance initiatives, so private enforcement mechanisms through which they can monitor compliance with their own codes of conduct. Um, these are obviously an important recognition by companies of their responsibility to monitor work throughout their supply chains, but have also been subject to uh, certain difficulties um, based on the way that they are designed, often without worker uh, input, and some allegations that they are not necessarily always the most accountable. Uh, we can talk maybe a little bit later of um, uh, some advantages as well as disadvantages of private compliance initiatives. But I think I'd rather just move on so we can focus more on not just corporate codes of conduct and private compliance initiatives, which are really animals for lead firms, and examine a little bit more what can be done throughout the supply chain to um, address fundamental principles and rights at work. So as you all know, the proliferation of supply chains raises significant challenges uh, with respect to the promotion of fundamental principles and rights at work. It leads to uh, a certain governance gap with respect to decent work. A lot of the examples I've been talking about are lead firms at the top of the supply chain who have detailed corporate codes of conduct as well as uh, robust private compliance initiatives that enable them to examine uh, compliance with the fundamental principles and rights at work. But once you leave the lead firm and go down the supply chain, it becomes increasingly difficult to be able to detect violations uh, and enforce compliance. I think in uh, developing countries, small and medium enterprises uh, in compose about 80 to 90% of all employment. A lot of these small and medium enterprises are uh, found lower down on the supply chain, which means that it's essential that we examine how fundamental principles and rights and work are promoted in those uh, companies, but it also makes it a lot more difficult. Corporate codes of conduct and uh, private compliance initiatives are, of course, much more common in companies uh, uh, that have an active interest in brand management uh, and often are more subject either to consumer pressure or NGO pressure, but a lot of business-to-business -business, um, uh, enterprises who mostly would be producing uh, as inputs into other businesses and other businesses, often there's more of an absence of uh, corporate initiatives in that regard. Um, I wanted to examine a bit uh, across the four categories that we identified earlier, forced labor, child labor, freedom of association, and non-discrimination, specific initiatives that have been launched with respect to addressing specifically um, uh, these uh, issues across supply chains. Um, so with respect to forced labor, obviously most companies actively avoid forced labor, but sometimes they, through their business relationships, will become involved with companies that actively do try to hide the fact that they use forced labor. Um, uh, and uh, there has been a lot of progress recently in trying to get companies to do more robust monitoring down their supply chain. One really exciting initiative are, uh, has been national legislative initiatives to ask companies to examine what is going on in their supply chain with respect to forced labor. Uh, in 2010, California adopted a law in that respect, and Britain did, I think, last year in 2015. We're going to watch a very short video uh, on uh, these initiatives. It's actually an advertisement for a company that provides a service to, company, uh, to other companies uh, in order to adhere to these obligations, but I think they explain the legislative initiatives in a clear manner. There are an estimated 30 million slaves in the world, more than at any other time in history. In 2015, the UK Modern Slavery Act became law. It brings into effect a systematic approach to combat this global epidemic. 
Under the Act, any business with an annual turnover in excess of $51 million must meet transparency requirements involving human rights due diligence. Companies registered abroad with a subsidiary operating in the UK must also meet the Act's obligations. The global supply chains of big corporations make them particularly vulnerable. Direct suppliers may seem clear of slavery and human trafficking, but there can be issues further down the chain at the second, third or even fourth levels. Under the new legislation, companies must make an annual statement accessible from the home page of their website, setting out what steps they have taken to ensure that their own business and any part of their supply chains are free from slavery and human trafficking. This is similar to the 2010 California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, SB 657, which requires retail sellers and manufacturers conducting business in California and over $100 million annual turnover to publicly disclose steps taken to eradicate slavery and human trafficking from their supply chains. If you are one of the thousands of companies to which the UK Modern Slavery Act or California's SB 657 apply, you need to take action now. The statement must be ready for each financial year ending on or after April 1st. Ignorance is no defense. Failure to comply could have serious implications to you and your business, including damage to your reputation, impact on your operations and fines, and could lead to issuance of an injunction to force compliance. LexisNexis can help you comply with your risk management obligations. And then the rest is an ad for LexisNexis. Um, but it is interesting that now they're developing services to then help companies comply with legislative initiatives that have been enacted when states realize we have an obligation uh, to eradicate forced labor. Practically, how do we do that? We need to work with companies. Uh, there has been estimates that approximately $150 billion in profit are generated every year from forced labor. Um, another example of how they're really working uh, across supply chains to address forced labor is the fishing sector. Um, recently, I think uh, the use of forced labor in uh, the Thai fishing sector has received quite a bit of scrutiny. Thailand is a major uh, seafood, seafood exporter to both the US and the EU. It has uh, a comparative advantage in that it's been very, very successful in adhering to food safety standards, which are very important uh, if you're trying to export seafood. Um, and uh, it's been very successful in adhering to food safety standards. Allegations indicate that it's been less successful in adhering to labor standards. But part of that is the difficulty of the sector. Fishing, labor standards and fishing is notoriously difficult to monitor. By its very nature, the workplaces are mobile. Uh, there are a lot of small, small boats, small and medium sized enterprises. And labor inspectors really do have a hard time even getting to the boats before they're then able to uh, investigate labor practices on the boats. In Thailand in particular, um, the modality through which forced labor is often alleged to occur is um, uh, in uh, various countries in the region, but most specifically Myanmar. Uh, workers from that country uh, have a strong desire to go and work in Thailand, pay, this might sound familiar, pay a uh, labor supplier a huge fee to be able to get smuggled into the country illegally. Uh, Often they apply for jobs in factories or uh, in other contexts. When they arrive in the country, they are informed, nope, you're working on a fishing boat. And then that uh, they, their wages are lower than promised and will continue to be garnished until they can pay back uh, the labor contractor. I know the EU is currently undertaking a second investigation uh, against uh, this, uh, into these allegations uh, with a view to potentially banning the imports of seafood from Thailand into the EU. I think that would have an impact of about one, at least a billion out of a $7 billion industry. The government has therefore, or on its own free will, been very proactive in trying to address this. And the ILO is actually very active in partnering with the Thai government to try to address forced labor specifically in this sector. Um, but like I said, uh, monitoring labor conditions on fishing boats is notoriously difficult, so a lot of uh, the work being done is on training labor inspectors uh, in being able to detect uh, specific indicators of forced labor um, and then trying to build capacity in that respect. Uh, 
With respect to child labor across supply chains, this is perhaps a happy note that there's been, uh, over the last 15 years, tremendous uh, progress made in this respect. I think in 2000, uh, the global estimates for child labor globally were 246 million children in child labor. Today, estimates have declined to about 168 million. Uh, still quite a few children, but it demonstrates that a lot of progress has been made. One, uh, one specific sector where we've seen quite a bit of prog progress is in cocoa. Uh, cocoa, again, is a very difficult sector to monitor because often cocoa beans are sourced from small holding, uh, small holding farms uh, uh, spread across various regions. And then often these farms are, of course, operating in um, systems of uh, entrenched rural poverty with insufficient educational infrastructure. And in that context, addressing child labor can be tremendously difficult. Um, but a lot of national governments partnering with the ILO have made a lot of progress in addressing child labor in this specific sector. One innovative um, initiative that's been quite successful, uh, and I think they, I'm just checking, yeah, it was implemented in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, and Togo, uh, was like we saw in the video at the beginning, the uh, community uh, integrated approach that involves an entire community in an area uh, in addressing child labor in the specific sector. Um, and the modality through which this works is that communities are asked to develop community action plans um, uh, as to how they are going to address child labor in cocoa in their area. Once they have developed that plan, they submit that plan uh, to uh, the project, which will then give them funding not only to implement the plan, but then also to improve educational facilities in that specific region, and also to fund child labor monitoring um, uh, systems, which are often a partnership not only between the traditional labor inspectorate, but also social services or educational institutions to ensure that once children are identified, they're not just removed from uh, the uh, cocoa fields and that's it, but then they're linked with appropriate educational or other social services. Uh, another important aspect of these projects has been uh, training with adults working in the sector to improve productivity. Um, uh, so agronomy courses and uh, access to specific um, technology that would enable them to be more productive and thereby reduce the need to recruit children into, um, uh, into that sector. Um, one thing I just want to quickly highlight is um, for those of you who are interested in more about the ILO's work specifically with businesses on child labor, uh, they've recently developed a child labor guidance tool for businesses. Um, and this is developed in partnership with the International Organization for Employers, which is the umbrella group for um, national employers organizations globally. It's based on the experience that all of these national employers have developed over the last 15 years in addressing um, child labor in their specific supply chains uh, and then breaking that down into useful guidance on practically what uh, companies might be able to do. Um, great, great. Um, uh, so we've talked about a lot of positive initiatives that are ongoing to address freedom of uh, forced labor as well as a lot of progress that's been made with respect to child labor. Freedom of association remains a particular challenge, I think, in addressing uh, across supply chains. Often we see that, especially lower down supply chains, uh, where workers are working in informal um, contacts are under non-standard forms of employment. They lack both the leverage and the organization uh, to be able to uh, effectively engage in social dialogue. Um, another trend that you do see is that with growing competition between suppliers, the profits, uh, the profit margin of these suppliers lower down the chain 
is, has shrunk quite a bit and often collective bargaining then permits workers and employers to share the benefit of those profits. As profits get squeezed with increased competition, there's less to share, um, which is of course a challenge. But there has been a lot of progress. I know, for example, in South Africa, in the textile sector, um, there has been a lot of work uh, with regard to sectoral collective agreements that have uh, ensured decent work for workers um, in that context, as well as uh, allowing for wages higher than the minimum wage to be paid. With respect to non-discrimination and equality, again, there are significant challenges. I think studies have indicated that with respect to easily detectable violations, non-payment of wages, child labor, uh, there's been a lot more success with respect to private compliance initiatives, detecting and monitoring these violations. With respect to non-discrimination, there hasn't been that same level of documented success in addressing this problem in supply chains. Uh, one successful uh, mechanism through which non -discri uh, discrimination can be addressed though, uh, that is proven fruitful, is targeted training either to company, company management, or to labor inspectors in certain countries so that they are more sensitive to um, issues related to discrimination and more able to detect um, those. Because often enforcement through private compliance initiatives uh, might uh, not be able to detect violations with respect to discrimination, but when officials and uh, employers are more aware of these issues, there has been a certain level of success with respect to uh, the ILO, for example, has done training with respect to um, women's rights uh, and sexual harassment, uh, the discrimination against persons with disabilities, uh, as well as most recently, uh, they've launched a project called Pride, which is to address uh, discrimination against uh, LGBT workers in certain countries, uh, notably in Thailand. And I think Indonesia was the second. Um, overall, uh, we've really seen that um, Complex and fragmented supply chains make ensuring decent work that much harder. It makes communication harder, it makes coordination harder, and it makes monitoring compliance that much more difficult. Um, nonetheless, though, there has been a lot of progress made. Uh, governments have been very innovative. Companies have been extraordinarily proactive in addressing some of these decent work deficits. And it's important that we continue to support and promote those important successes. Because in the end, labor rights are human rights and human rights are labor rights. And respecting those rights are key to ensuring sustainability. Thank you.